Great. Uh, thank you, Rowan. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Tim Briglin, the chair of the House Energy and Technology Committee. It is Thursday, March 17th. Um, it, this is our nine o'clock hearing. And this morning, we are going to um, touch on the world of uh, cellular telephone um, tower sighting. And the reason um, we're having this discussion this morning, I don't want to say at an introductory level, because this committee has dealt with some of these issues before, but um, we're going to return to them um, for, for a couple of reasons. One, um, there's a proposal from the governor, uh, an appropriations proposal to um, invest in um, publicly funded um, cell tower sites uh, in Vermont. Um, and that is something that this committee um, supported in terms of a $21.5 million appropriation, some of it for planning, some of it for actual capital um, construction. And that is in the Appropriations Committee right now. We'll see where that uh, goes through the budget process. But, um, you know, there are questions that, is, that have come to this committee, you know, through email and otherwise in recent weeks about, you know, how we cite cell towers in the state, especially ones that are publicly funded. Um, there's a member of our committee, Representative Pat, that has a cell tower proposal um, in, in uh, one of the towns that he represents that's garnered a lot of uh, a lot of attention publicly and you know maybe an opportunity to learn from some of the you know issues that are being discussed there um, as we consider as a legislature um, you know appropriating money to support this kind of work and um, it's not entirely clear to me how much policy ground um, in terms of changing statute we're going to break uh, in terms of you know dealing with 248a excuse me 248a issues in title 30 um, we may but um, just as as i said kind of an introduction to those conversations that might occur between now and the legislative at the end of the legislative session um, i wanted to um, at least you know dip our toe into this water if that's possible uh, without going up to our hips um, in, in this in this area so this morning we have our legislative counsel, Ellen Chikowski, um, and this is her area of expertise in statute. Um, we also have uh, the leadership team in the telecom area at the Department of Public Service, uh, Clay Purvis, Jim Porter, and um, Commissioner Tierney is with us as well. I wanted to first turn to, uh, you know, give us some background on this issue, and then we'll turn to uh, the team from the Department of Public Service. So, uh, Alan, thanks for being thanks for being with us. It's only been what maybe two weeks since we've had you here uh, for six hours a day. So, welcome back. Thanks. Good morning, Ellen Jaikowski, Office of Legislative Counsel. So, uh, big picture, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 was federal legislation uh, that regulates telecommunications within the United States. That legislation um, dictated that the federal government regulates telecommunications, except that state and local authority still has the ability to regulate telecommunications facilities in regards to the siting of them, so their physical location. That is why this falls under my expertise, because in the state, um, the, the primary regulation is in regards to their, um, in their, their land use permitting, essentially. So there are two, I think there, it's fair to say there are two different permitting pathways that happen for a telecommunications facility in the state. Um, so if someone wants to construct a cell phone tower or add, um, a small cell um, facility, um, they have an op, they're sort of an, these two <coughs> optional pathway, pathways. Um, currently, the construction of a, of a cell tower could trigger Act 250. Um, however, they, ha they have the option to either go down the Act 250 permitting route or go through Section 248A of Title 30. If a, an applicant is looking to construct something they and they decide to go through the Act 250 process, they may also need to get local permitting 
from a municipality if they have zoning regulations in place that would require a permit. So if an applicant is looking to go down the Act 250 path, it's Act 250 and municipal zoning. However, um, since Act, uh, since Section 248A was added to statute, I, I think most uh, applicants choose to go through the Title 30 process under Section 248A. If they go that route, they are exempt from going through Act 250 and the municipal process. Um, so that, those are the two sort of um, big frameworks we're looking at here. The federal government states that the, that the state and municipalities have the ability to regulate based on the siting of the tower. Um, the federal government has the authority over the rates and other aspects of telecommunications, but the state is still allowed to regulate based on the siting look and location of a facility. Um, so 248A um, has three um, categories of projects. So when an applicant files, there are sort of three um, buckets of projects that a, a three categories that a project could fall into. Um, the smallest projects uh, are under the de minimis modifications. De minimis modifications are to existing uh, structures. And this is a pretty streamlined process. If an applicant is looking to uh, do one of these projects, they file an application with the PUC. The PUC is the regulating entity here in the Section 248A process. Uh, they, there, there is then a, no, they then provide notice to some the statutory parties. Uh, it is the, the town in which the project is located, the landowner where the project is located, and the Department of Public Service. And that is why they are here today. I think they'll be able to answer a lot of the detailed questions about um, some of the specific aspects of how these uh, applications play out. Um, and then there's a 21 day public comment period that's open, during which time people can uh, provide comments and raise issues. Um, but with de minimis projects, uh, the, the comments I think are largely uh, focused on whether or not the project is actually going to be a de minimis project. Uh, then the PUC, after the 21 day comment period, the PUC makes a determination after reviewing the comments and the application. Uh, they determine if it is going to be a, a de minimis modification and if they have, if the applicant has provided enough detail in their application to meet the statutory requirements and then they issue the decision. The decision here, by the way, that the, the permit they are seeking is a certificate <laughs> of public good. So that should sound familiar. Um, it does have, this process does have some similarities to the section 248 process, which is also a certificate of public good. So uh, communications facilities that are going through the 248A process are seeking a certificate of public good. So then for larger projects, the other two types of process, uh, the, the sort of buckets are projects of limited size or scope, and then large projects. So limited size and scope projects, there's a defined category of size. Um, and uh, so if a project is going to be fall under the, the limited size and scope category, it shall not exceed 140 feet in height, modify an existing facility or support structures that would result in total height of less than 200 feet, would not increase the width of the support structures by more than 20 feet, or uh, would not disturb more than 10,000 square feet of earth. So if it would fall into those parameters, um, it would be a project of limited size and scope. 
if it's going to be larger or exceed any of those thresholds, it would fall under the, the third category, which is for larger projects and the, the largest projects. And so then it has um, a similar but um, a similar process, but with more steps. So for these two types of larger projects, both of them require a 60 day advance notice period. Um, so that's before the application is actually filed. Um, that is when notice is filed um, with the statutory parties so that they are aware of the application. Um, so this includes the parties I've already mentioned. So uh, DPS, uh, the town, the landowner and adjacent landowners. Uh, then the, the application is filed. Then there's a 21 day public comment period during which there's also requests to intervene or requests for hearing on the projects. And if during the, the public comment period, there are significant issues that are raised, um, if there are no significant issues that are raised, the PUC will review the comments and the application and determine if the project meets the qualification to earn a certificate of public good. However, if there are significant issues raised during the public comment period, then there is um, the ability for the PUC to hold hearings on the application. So then there would be a scheduling conference. Um, there may be discovery from the parties where they'll file information. There may be testimony and exhibits uh, from uh, experts. Uh, there, could, there may be an evidentiary hearing uh, stipulations or memorandums of, of understanding, and the parties may have the option to file briefs on the issues in the case. And then after all of that, then the PUC would review the, the evidence in the case and determine if the project uh, has, uh, would be, should be, should receive a certificate of public good. Um, the um, I, so, so one of the other differences in the process between a project of limited size and scope and for larger projects are the amount of uh, criteria, there's a, there's a number of environmental criteria that are applied to a project. So projects of limited size and scope have a shorter list of criteria um, that they have to meet. Um, and I maybe want to defer to hearing from the experts on the specifics of that. They're not the same criteria that are used in Act 250, although there are some of the same criteria, um, but they're the typical environmental criteria I think you may be fam familiar with. Um, I did want to note one thing that I think might be of interest. So as I did mention, towns receive notice of these applications uh, when they're located uh, when a project is going to be located in a town, the town receives notice of the application. Um, in addition, they have the statutory right to appear and participate in all applications um, that are located in the town. Um, in addition, the commission is required to consider the comments and recommendations submitted by the town on um, these applications, and the PUC has to respond to the recommendations in the town um, in their decision. So that is the really high level overview of the 248A process. So Alan, we've got a couple of questions in the room and um, I would, would also welcome um, the folks from the department if they also want to chime in on some of these, but um, go ahead, Representative Spilly. Thanks, uh, good morning, Alan. Uh, I actually have a question uh, about regulation um, and your earlier statements about federal preemption. And maybe this may actually be a question for you, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure. Uh, so we have uh, Vermont <clears throat> move forward with our net neutrality laws. Uh, we had both an executive order and a law that we had passed. Uh, and we were sued by the entire telecommunications industry I think that that uh, situation has reached a point um, uh, that we should hear more about. 
perhaps uh, related to our ability to regulate um, in the state. And we also had received, and I want, I, this is my question for you, Ellen. Have you spoken with Maria Royal about uh, the Mozilla uh, case and the judgment there related to our ability to regulate here? No, I, I am not, I'm not familiar with that case. Okay, so Mr. Chair, I, I would just like to suggest it might be something we wanted to hear about. Those are both issues related to consumer protection, uh, which we have not, uh, we've been prevented uh, by preemption from really considering our, our consumers and have been fighting for a long time. And those two pieces, both the Mozilla judgment and uh, the what's happening with the net neutrality case, I think are extremely relevant here. So I would just like to ask us to consider um, additionally hearing from them from this. Great. Did, did you have more for her? That's it. Okay. The, the question that I have, and this might be getting a little bit too quickly into the weeds, but it's something that has come up in this uh, committee when we were discuss, uh, discussing the, the governor's proposal uh, last month. And it's also been a kind of question at a high level um, that's come up with regard to wireless, you know, cell, cell tower deployment. Um, and that is in Title 30, 248A, there's a reference to um, you know the facilities promoting the general good of the state consistent with subsection 202 CB of this title. And looking at 202 CB, um, there's reference to the deployment of cell towers not negatively impacting um, uh, the future improvements in the deployment of broadband technology and encouraging the use of existing facilities in preference to, um, to new taller structures. But a question about how some of the work that we may be proposing here and funding through this budget this year might affect um, the deployment of broadband technology and the, um, whether it's the department or ultimately the PUC having to take that into consideration in issuing a, um, a certificate of public good how that plays into, you know, what we might be looking to do in um, in the coming years, I'll say. But you know, how much does how much um, how much will that come into play in this discussion? Because I've heard some concerns, actually, from people in this room, but also again, kind of in the CUD world, of you know, if we're going to build whatever it is, another fifty, um, another hundred cell towers. How is that going to overlap with or impede the work that we're doing in an adjacent technology area? I'm happy to pass that question. I do not know. Okay. Jim or Clay, I don't know if, if that's something you guys can comment on. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I'm happy to do that. Uh, this is Clay Purvis with the Department of Public Service. Uh, this is certainly a question that's uh, come up in the past. Um, I think the concern is if we build cell towers that ultimately provide LTE service, that people might prefer to purchase the LTE service over the fixed broadband that's coming, so the, the fiber product. And I think that concern uh, rests on... Um, I think a, a misunderstanding um, of kind of how LTE service is used versus uh, fixed broadband. I don't see the two competing against each other. And in fact, I think most people would prefer to have um, the, uh, the wireline broadband service at their home for a variety of reasons. One, it's going to be a more stable connection for home use. Um, you know, you're, you've got your, your television and your smart appliances and um, your computer all running. You know, that's, uh, that's really not how LTE service uh, is presently designed to um, handle that amount of, of data and, and on that uh, can, with, the, with the kind of consistency that consumers come to expect. Um, so I, I think that uh, you're going to find that people are going to prefer to purchase the wireline product 
um, for their home rather than rely on an LTE service. They'll also buy a, a cell phone and uh, a lot of people do that. I am one uh, person who buys both. Um, I think probably most people in the room um, are purchasing both if they have it available to them. So, um, you know, I don't see them as mutually exclusive. Where I do think you're going to see people prefer LTE service or where they currently do um, <clears throat> are folks who are priced out of the wireline um, option. So if they can't afford the wireline broadband product or service that's uh, available at their home, um, they're going to tend to purchase the the, the phone first. Um, so we're talking about low income people that probably wouldn't be participating in the wireline market to begin with. Um, and, um, you know, that requires a different solution um, other than um, simply expanding broadband that gets into questions of um, broadband affordability. Um, but the when we're when we're talking about our proposal here, I mean, we're really focused on, we're not really focused on home broadband service. We're really focused on, on highways, uh, places where there's already some population density. So there's probably already wireline broadband there. Um, uh, but, you know, highway voice on the highways is really where we're going with this. Um, we, we want to be able to, you know, use our cell phones for emergency calling for the mobile aspect of mobile service. So um, the uh, uh, the commercial uses like tourism, precision agriculture is becoming a bigger thing. Um, and, you know, wireline broadband can't help the farmer in the field uh, like LTE service can. So there are applications where wireless is really going to be the only method of providing connectivity. And that's what we're really focused on. Okay. And so just at a very high level, what I'm hearing is from a market perspective, your sense is, is that the bar is pretty high uh, in order to make the case that the deployment of a, um, pro of a telecommunications product that's using a cell tower facility the bar is pretty high that that's impeding the deployment of a of a wireline broadband service. Yes, I, I think that's correct. I think where you might see some competition is really in the dense denser areas where carriers are focused on densification of their networks, and that's going to be Boston and New York and you know maybe Burlington someday. That's where five G comes into play, but. You know, 5G is really not a rural um, solution, and I don't think it's ever going to be. When we're building these macro towers, we're really still talking about 4G. Um, they're calling it 4G advanced now, but, you know, it's, it's, I just don't think it's going to ever become a replacement for wireline service. Um, I think people want the, the consistency and the reliability that wireline broadband provides as well as the other services that wireline carriers also can provide like home telephone, though that's becoming less important, but you know, the, the video packages, the, the home security, the, you know, all these other things that, um, that wireline carriers provide. And in fact, in many, or in some cases, um, we're seeing the wireline carrier now offering cell phones as an add on. So it's really kind of working the other way you know, you sign up for Comcast, for instance, and you get a cell phone. Um, and that may be something that the CUDs do someday, I don't know, but um, I, it seems to be almost the other way around, uh, not mobile carriers um, eating the lunch, the wireline broadband provider. Um, so before we generally uh, turn to our guest from the department, um, Representative Rogers also has a question. Um, yeah, I think this is going back to Ellen's um, part, but I, I guess just I just wanted to clarify that I'm understanding correctly. So the the choice of going through Act 250 or 248A lies entirely with the the what is the word provider. applicant? Provider. Yeah. yeah, applicant. Um, which is which, and that, I guess that's a good clarification. The applicant would usually be like 
a provider like AT and T, Verizon? Is that who the applicant usually would be? Um, usually, it's who's ever seeking to construct the facility. So it could be, it could be someone else. But it, um, I think usually it's a provider. Um, the department may have other examples, but it, it can be anyone seeking to construct. So it could be a developer, or it could be um, a private person seeking to put up a, an antenna somewhere. Okay, and then the reason why uh, most applicants would choose 248A is, is it because it's considered a faster process, a less expensive process? I mean, I, maybe this, I don't know if, if any of the witnesses have an, an answer to that. Um, yeah, it is hard to generalize. I, um, but yes, that is one thing I, I failed to mention. There are um, deadlines by which uh, the PUC needs to respond to applications. Um, okay. That is true also for Act 250. I do think there may be a perception that the 248 process moves more quickly than the Act 250 process. Um, I, can't, I can't fully speculate. I think there are a lot of people who dislike the Act 250 process for a variety of reasons. Um, so this option was created, I think, in uh, it was created a number of years ago. One other small legal thing I wanted to mention is that there's a, a sunset on Section 248A that the legislature built in. And so it does come up for regular review by the legislature. And so currently it is set to sunset next summer. Um, but it was an, op I, uh, yeah. So, so yes, uh, I think people have a, a variety of reasons why they would choose to go before the PUC as opposed to go through the Act 250 process. Okay, thank you. And I do have to go to another committee. Um, and so I'm happy to come back, but I do think you have the experts in the room who participate in all of the um, applications. So they may have more detail to provide than my high, high overview. Thank you, Ellen, for being with us. Um, and I'm gonna, um, just for kind of clarification purposes, um, kind of piggyback off of Representative Rogers' question and the, the question of, um, some of the timelines that are laid out in 248A, are those more, uh, I don't know if there are any federal constraints or um, designations as to what very specifically some of those timelines are that have to be met in order to approve a siting proposal or not that are incorporated into 248A and maybe are not in 250, which is a more general um, kind of land use uh, development law. So are, are, the, are the timelines in 248A something that more um, fall in line with federal guidelines? Do you want to handle that, Jim? Or do you yeah, want to so the, I think the answer to that is there is a federal law that, that says that any petition for siting, I think, has to be completed. Is it 180 days, Clay? Um, uh, I, I actually can't remember the timeline, uh, but I, I believe it's shorter than uh, the, the act, uh, Section 248A. Um, uh, and there have been some changes over the years to the, the federal timelines, but I, and, my understanding is currently right now they don't align. And, and I'm not sure they do align. And is, is one thing Ellen said, you know, with telecom regulation at the state level, you know, you the state essentially gets to regulate what the, the federal law says it can, and that's not always that clear. And the statute that I'm talking about that's federal, um, the providers, or it's referred to as the shot clock um, statute. And on occasion, if a cell, um, if a cell tower proposal language is too long um you know ever so often you'll have a petitioner rattle and say we're going to invoke the the shot clock it's never happened um mm -hmm. and i think generally from speaking with all of the providers our 248a i think provides a um what everybody considers to be a pretty workable and fair framework for cell permitting Um, Representative Sebelia. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, Jim. So uh, related to um, the shot clock legislation, uh, do you have a sense of, uh, or have you 
um, assessed or done any work to see if uh, that is in conflict with uh, Mozilla or these decisions around net neutrality that are, are uh, seem to be giving states uh, more ability to regulate and look at consumer protection. So the question is, are those in conflict? Have you, have has the department uh, done any assessment about that? I don't believe we have. I don't believe it's become an issue for any cases that we've had thus far. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Representative Sophia, I would just add, uh, I think the shot clocks are, um, are, are in the Telecommunications Act and the Spectrum Act of 2012. So, um, you know, they're, they're kind of expressed, they're in statute. Um, um, it, it's a little more cut and dry than um, other preemption issues. Uh well, actually, uh, why don't you explain that to me? Why that is more cut and dry than other oh, I apologize. Issues. Yeah, that, no, that's probably not the, the right way to explain that. Um, I would just, I think that the, the ability of the FCC's uh, um, jurisdiction is, is expressed in the statute. Um, whereas with net neutrality, there is a, a debate as to the state's jurisdiction over that issue. So my question, uh, and please pull me back if I'm too deep down the I will. hole. I won't let you go over the question. Okay, so uh, my question is uh, around the shot clock issue. Uh, and um, in Vermont, and whether or not that, <clears throat> That, uh, that, that legislation in Vermont, which prevents us or seeks to prevent us or threatens to present, prevent us from uh, citing regulation, from, you know, from different citing things that we might want to do. I mean, that, that legislation is in place to expedite citing. And so my question is <clears throat> that legislation in Vermont, which seeks to prevent us from consumer protection inciting in light of the Mozilla decision and what has been happening with net neutrality has the department <clears throat> looked at whether or not or assessed whether or not that uh, ability to prevent us from consumer protection uh, is still on really steady ground. Uh, I just defer to Jim on that one. I don't, as he said, I don't think we've looked at that. Yeah, I have not. And um, when you say consumer protection, I automatically think about the attorney general's office, which is, you know, that tends to be um, in that realm, I think more their purview. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, so Clay and Jim, I actually want to pull back a little bit. I know some of our questions have focused on some of the um, detail in 248A, but um, you know, really the, the high level reason I want to make sure we um, are hearing from you this morning is to think about citing issues um, and some of the opportunities and challenges um, in Vermont around citing and the governor's proposal here. Um, I think some of the questions of this committee a few weeks ago, as we were talking about um, our recommendations to the Appropriations Committee is you know, 100 cell phone tower sites is a lot of sites um, to, you know, to put in place in Vermont in a whatever, a four or five year period. And, you know, we look at some of the work that has been done in um, uh, the, um, the net um, the at t tower, I'm forgetting the name of the program. First the first net um, program. And, you know, some of the challenges of citing, you know, a few dozen towers and this is a much more ambitious, um, uh, you know, a program that's being uh, proposed by the department and the governor. So I just want to hear more, you know, whether it's, you know, there are citing issues that you have to deal with um, and how this kind of fits into the world that we're living in right now in terms of, you know, resistance in some communities from people want cell phone service, but they don't want cell phone towers. And you know how that plays into the the work that you're looking to to unroll here. So, so Mr. Chair, um, I'm going to defer to Clay 
completely on his ideas for the, the cellular proposal. Would it be at all helpful to have a very quick synopsis of how the current process works? And what I have in mind, frankly, is the proposed tower that's in Representative Pat's um, district. Yeah, if you'd like to speak to that and, you know, again, and kind of dovetail off of some of Alan's, um, you know, kind of overview, that, that would be really helpful, I think. And, and that can take us into Clay providing some more detail about um, the, you know, the, the, the capital proposal, I'll call it, for, our, um, for cell tower construction. So the, the first thing, you know, 248A has kind of, has been very dynamic and I think it has been amended several times over the years um, to try to fit the needs of, you know, when communities have, have felt that they don't have a voice, you know, kind of balancing the interests. And one of the things that was more recently added was one of the problems was you would have a company file a petition and once the petition was filed, then you have a legal process and it's a little more complicated um, to deal with that in an informal way. So one in many of our um, things under um, section 248 and 248A required the 60 day notice filing. But what was amended in 248A is that the, the municipalities, when they received that notice, they are, the petitioners are required to, within that notice, say, here are the things you can do, essentially, if you're concerned about this project during the notice period. One of the things is, you know, the department has the ability um, to retain experts in various fields for various proceedings um, that are then billed back to the petitioner. So frequently, when after 248A was amended, because typically that was only available to us when a petition was filed. <laughs> so, for instance, in the and so what the what this requires is during the notice period before anything's filed, um, where a process is started, the town is given the ability to have a public meeting that the department attends where we can go ahead and retain experts and the company has to come in and do a presentation. And then when that happens, um, there's the ability to have interaction with the town. You know, the town may say, you know, we would like to have this service, but it would be better if it were located on, on this hilltop over here. And frequently that process has been successful. Um, the one thing I'll tell you of the, and Clay's got the numbers, we see a huge number of petitions every year. Most of them are the de minimis classification, which really is um, practicality. It's when people swap out um, antennas on existing structures. But of the full tower proposals that we get, um, there have been maybe five that I can that come to mind that have been controversial over the years. And typically, I think because of the way 248A is structured, the, the process works. Some of the companies bend over backwards when there is um, protest from the town and in many instances relocate the tower to facilitate the town. And so um, the one thing I wanna say is 248A is a process that I think probably works as, as well as any that we deal with. Um, and, and my guess is that the, the process in, in the instance of the one that's in Representative Pat's district, my, my guess is um, that that one is gonna work out as well at the end of the day. Could you say that again, the last part of what you said? My, my guess is that case will work out at the end of the day. Um, you know, there's still a lot more meetings and visits that will occur. And we certainly hope that in that instance, the petitioner will listen to what the people in the town is saying about the proposed location of that site. 
It has been the time for me. Yeah, go, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I was teeing you up. I, um, when this happened in, in, in Worcester, it's not just uh, one of the towns in the district, I live in Worcester. Um, uh, the, and I looked at 248A, um, it, you know, first of all, uh, and I, I have mentioned this to committee members informally, I told them that I met with you uh, uh, about this. Um, and actually, I think it was a day or two later was when the, the, uh, the commissioner spoke about your proposal at the, at the press conference and outlined the uh, community engagement and public engagement process that you would do on, you know, with, under your proposal. And my response to people in Worcester was that exact, is exactly what was missing um, in, uh, uh, with, with this company. And I understand from you and others that some companies that put in proposals do more of that and some don't. I don't think this, this company did not do any. Um, and so I am, I am seriously looking, I mean, the, the, the process is underway and it will be uh, what it will be. And the, the, this little town had to learn how to get, uh, be prepared and hire uh, a lawyer with expertise in these matters and, and things like that in a hurry. Um, uh, but I would like to see uh, something in the statute uh, that there is, uh, and I, I don't know how to phrase it and what would be legal and all of that, but that there is an expectation uh, that there will be communication before the notice is filed. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and the kind of discussion that the department said you would be engaged in, in, in any of the sightings that you, you would be doing under your uh, budget proposal. So that's what that's what was missing. This was kind of dropped out of the blue. No one knew what was coming. Uh, I also uh, do think that for a project of this magnitude, um, there should be some some additional um, guidance or limitations on on large projects in terms of proximity to people's homes. Uh, not an outright ban. But that you you need to have some kind of agreement with with somebody before you put a, a tower of that size 300 feet from somebody's house, uh, and who did not know that they were planning to do that until the notice was filed. So th I, I would I would like to see the statute um, uh, changed a bit to to avoid uh, this kind of thing. And I I do know, and I've said this. Uh, from in my utility experience with 248A, when Washington Electric Co-op was proposing a 248 project, we went to everybody well ahead of time. Uh, and if the neighbors said, "Could you do something or move it over here a little bit more?" You know, uh, yes, and that, it was in in our interest, and it's in the interest of a cell tower proposer's interest, I would think. Um, uh, uh, to do that at, uh, up front, to put out a proposal that will get um, no opposition or, or less opposition. And it, didn't, it didn't happen here. And I, I'm, I'm looking at, at how to correct that in the future. Thank you. So I, I'll just generally ask, is there, um, you know, in the, in the department's view, and maybe you don't have one yet, um, but is there, you know, is there an appropriate change to, you know, address some of the issues that Representative Pat has here? Um, and again, acknowledging that it sounds like the department is going down, you know, as a practice going down this path, is this something that should be more directly, um, you know, focused on, um, you know, the market at, at large? In 248A. Thank, and, and Clay can probably answer that. I think what I was trying to say, and I'll be a little more explicit this time earlier, I don't remember a cell project that was approved that met the kind of opposition that we got in, in the Worcester case. Um, I, I don't remember that happening. Yes, the process can be a little messy. This company, to the, this is the first time I remember seeing a petition by this company. Clay may correct me and tell me that it's been around for five years, but 
But I, I think to some extent, this petition is a bit of an anomaly, but I, I'll let Clay, Clay fill in. Yeah, I, uh, I think, you know, one of the issues um, that this particular case raises is the physical distance between the tower and, um, and, and residential buildings. And this one, I think is close, it's three, 300 feet, which I don't remember seeing that before. Um, we've seen that kind of proximity, of course, to commercial buildings which, you know, is, you know, uh, typical and, and expected, but um, uh, I, I can't remember one being cited in a residential neighborhood um, that close to other houses before. So this is, um, this is one that I think, um, at least a contested case that um, um, will be a, a new issue for us to, to think about um, I, I don't know if I have a recommendation for a hard and fast number um, of, of distance. I mean, I think one of the challenges of cell siting is that it's really case specific. Um, it really has to do with geography of, of the site and um, the expectations of the community. And um, one, um, you know, one piece where I think um, towns um, succeed or one area where towns succeed is having a robust town plan that really identifies areas where they'd like to see cell coverage and where they don't. And I know quite a few towns have over the years uh, updated their town plans to be more precise. And so some town plans will say something um, uh, short about wireless, like, um, you know, the town has spotty cell service, we could use more cell service or something like that. But, you know, then it doesn't address the, the land use questions. Other towns have very robust, um, you know, uh, citing uh, recommendations placed in their town plan uh, that call out conservation areas, um, uh, aesthetic um, areas to be protected and that kind of thing. And that's where I think, um, we, um, um, or I think that's where I think that maybe some of the focus could be um, uh, uh, put to um, to help clarify for the the petitioners, you know, where where when they're crossing the line, what what's okay, what's not okay in a given community. Do a follow up. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, I, I don't want to dominate this about Worcester, so I just want to mention one other thing that, <laughs> that, that, uh, that I have also mentioned uh, uh, to, uh, to the committee, or at least to some, some people. Um, and you may, you may be aware of this in, in your communication with people in Worcester, but there's been a very robust discussion in town in a variety of forums, including Front Porch Forum, uh, uh, about this issue, and uh, there have been some people who basically s said, uh, "Well, you know, cell service, uh, your cell phones, that's a convenience." And when they said that, they heard <laughs> from a whole lot of other people who disagreed very strongly uh, with that. So. Um, I think that the great majority of people, including people who uh, are oppose this particular proposal at this particular location, um, uh, recognize that, uh, that Worcester is very underserved in terms of cell coverage uh, and what that means. And, and I have pointed out to a number of people, because they wouldn't know this, uh, that uh, I think the number is 78% of 911 calls uh, come in over cell phones now that, that th these are, you know, critical uses uh, that it, it's, it's, not, it's not just people who are calling from their uh, uh, landline phone at home. It's people uh, in town and people traveling through town uh, who are uh, using uh, cell service businesses and, and all, of, all of that. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, make that clear that this is actually as, as emotional as it is for a lot of people. This has been, a, a, I guess, a very robust uh, discussion in this little town. 
Yes, uh, um, and uh, we hear that all the time uh, across many towns, and I'm sure you've heard about the the tower in Chelsea, and um, that's certainly um, uh, a point that's been um, brought up by um, some of the members of that community and the public safety community um, about that tower. You know, I think one uh, one thing about the, the Worcester um, tower that um, – again, makes it an outlier is that it actually is not a cell tower. Um, and that, um, I think, really changes the dynamic there. Um, as, as, as far as we know, at this point, there's actually no cell service that's going to be provided through that tower. It's a, it's a private radio tower. So um, you, you, you go back to 202C and what's in the public good, um, you know, the, the, the 202C um, identifies uh, mobile wireless coverage along state corridors, and that's a very important thing to have. Um, and, um, you know, not every communication facility provides cell service, but that's kind of where the state is focused uh, and its telecommunications policy. So um, it, it, at the end of the day, it's a weighting of um, uh, uh, of the pros and cons of a given facility and, um, you know, what, what we're willing to tolerate. I think everyone agrees cell towers are ugly. Um, I've never uh, been moved by one myself and I don't think anyone else has, but they're necessary um, for the communication that they provide. And so um, it's always a trade-off. So Claire, I want to um, kind of give the last word to you, and um, you know whether it's whether whether it's five minutes or you know what what time you need to take us through this. But again, just kind of thinking at a high level, how some of these siting issues, um, you know, to the extent you see them out there, affect you know what the department, what the governor is proposing with um, you know with this appropriation to support tel uh, excuse me cell tower construction. Sure. Um, I think Jim um, pointed this out, but I'll start by um, just reiterating that the vast majority of facilities um, go through with little or no objection. Um, in fact, many communities welcome cell facilities. And I was looking at the numbers um, uh, last night, and uh, according to EPUC, there have been uh, 79 limited size and scope and full petitions uh, uh, approved in, in the last three years, so that's 2019 to 2021. Um, and, you know, the vast majority of those, um, th th there was not a significant issue raised with regard to the, um, to the facility. So, um, you, you know, I think we hear a lot in the news about the towers that aren't going so well, but we rarely hear about the ones that are going just fine. Um, and so I don't know that I think of siting as a, as a big impediment to our project. That said, I will admit that 100 towers in four years, we have until 2026 to expend this money, um, is, is aggressive um, uh, for sure. Um, but uh, this is our one chance to uh, do something uh, big on cell service. And it is certainly something that we at the department here from uh, Vermonters um, all over from all corners of the state, uh, that is a big problem for them. We hear from businesses, it's a big problem for them. And um, it's one that we think merits um, uh, some focus. Um, we Given that it's our it's our money um, and it's our project, you know we've really put um, the siting questions to the forefront of the proposal. The proposal calls for 1.5 million in planning funds, um, and I thank you all for uh, your uh, consideration of the proposal and in your vote um, uh, on it two weeks ago. Uh, both the the nine to zero for the the planning and the eight to one uh, vote for the um, uh, the funding uh, is um, I think um, uh, heartening to to see, um, but it's uh, you know the the planning aspect I think is probably the most important piece of this 
in that um, we're, we're not going to be ramming these things down the throats of communities. Um, it, it involves identifying first the target corridor. So we're doing the drive test. We're um, identifying the areas that lack service. We wanna take those corridors to the, the communities, say, uh, you know, the town of Stratford, uh, for instance, and say, here are, your, here are your areas that lack cell service. Um, first, um, you know, what, which areas are important to you, if any, and if a community is very adamant that they don't want cell, uh, cell towers in their community, um, I, we don't see the need to build one there. Um, if, the, if the town select board um, is, is in opposition to a uh, state funded cell facility in that area, um, you know, you know I, I, it doesn't seem appropriate to put our focus there. I think there are many areas where we can um, do good in the state. And so um, that would be the first step. And then when we're identifying the search rings, again, we're coming back to the town and saying, okay, in order to serve this target quarter that, that we've all agree is, is um, important, um, here's where we need to site a facility. And um, again, receiving the feedback from the town, from the regional planning commissions, from ANR, uh, who would like to participate in this as well. And, and also um, working very closely with local and the state public safety organizations to make sure that we are providing coverage that um, is necessary for them. Um, so uh, th that's where we want to take this uh, in the planning stage, really weed out the, any controversies we might find early on before we get to the permitting stage. And that uh, we believe will make the permitting go quicker because if we can identify the significant issues um, at the forefront, we won't have to litigate them um, or the, the carrier won't have to litigate them um, at the PUC um, after it's filed its application. Clay, just as a follow up, and I should know this, but can, can you remind me um, the $1.5 million appropriation that this committee supported uh, that's to do, you know, kind of the drive tests and, you know, more of the upfront planning work. What was envisioned in terms of the, the time of actually expending and, and, you know, that money and doing that work? Is that a one year process? Is that a, what, 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 yes. what is it like? Uh, yes, that would be. You know, we'd like to be at the permitting stage by the summer of 2023. So um, uh, that that process would include um, identifying the target corridors, um, meeting with the towns, um, uh, publishing that data, meeting with the towns to, to figure out uh, what the target corridors are, and then doing the search ring analysis. So, you know, before the summer of 2023, we're ready to um uh, put these sites out to bid got it okay. um i'm looking around the table to see if there are other questions uh I, I will say this was just helpful for me in terms of kind of ramping up my you know recollection of some of these issues which i feel like personally i turn to you know once a year um, and every time i come back to them i know a little bit more but there's plenty that i've forgotten as well so i, I appreciate um, you know, you folks from the department and Ellen, who's um, had to go to another hearing, um, giving this committee a refresher on this stuff, because I know we're going to continue to hear from constituents and folks around the state about this issue. And obviously, it's really topical because of um, the recommendation of the department and the governor uh, that's, uh, you know, that's being incorporated into the budget process this year. So I appreciate, uh, appreciate your time with us this morning. Great. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you.